This video explains the diversity of reproductive strategies in some animals. If we look at asexual versus sexual reproduction, we have spoken about this in a previous video, but asexual reproduction involves one parent where sexual needs two parents. Asexual reproduction produces offspring that are genetically identical to each other and to the parent, whereas sexual offspring produces offspring that are genetically unique from each other and from the parents. Asexual reproduction involves mitosis, so cell replication, whereas sexual reproduction involves mitosis and meiosis. If we look at some reproductive strategies, these are anatomical, physiological, behavioral, and ecological components that contribute to successful reproduction. So if we look at anatomical, that would just be the body structure. Physiological would be like hormones and pheromones. Uh, behavioral would be like courting and rituals. And ecological components would be um, how the environment affects the reproductive strategies. So there's a whole lot of different strategies. So like um, low parental care, but having more babies or um, higher parental care, but fewer babies. So that would be like elephants and people, whereas more babies and low parental care would be something um, like insects or fish. Um, so reproductive behavior is a total range of behaviors that combine to ensure that sexually mature individuals of the same species meet, recognize each other as being of the same species, mate, and leave enough viable offspring to maximize reproductive success and continue the species. So the individuals must be sexually mature. They have to be of the same species because um, if something is of the same species, this means that they, when they are reproduced, they must produce fertile offspring. So for example, we know that um, a donkey and a horse can reproduce and pr produce an ass, but asses are not um, fertile. So that means that a horse and a donkey is not the same species as a very basic example. These individuals have to recognize each other as being of the same species so that they know that they can um, mate and produce a fertile offspring. Then they have to actually mate and they have to leave enough offspring that is viable so that will live and produce more offspring of their own that maximizes the reproductive success of the species and continues the species. So that any behaviors which ensure the survival of individuals all the way to reproductive maturity so that these individuals can mate and um, reproduce, these behaviors are likely to be advantageous to the species because they carry on the species. So courtship is a behavior in which males and females of the same species prepare for copulation. So it's not the actual act of copulation, but it's how they um, do this, how they meet, how they recognize each other, and then how they um, mate after, afterwards. Um, courtship, as I said, ensures that the males and the females of the same species recognize each other. And often animals use rituals for courtship. So rituals is a series of behaviors for communication that is performed in the same way by all the males or females in that species. So each species has a unique ritual. Uh, for example, um, a fish eagle may have a different ritual to a tawny eagle, um, even though they're very similar birds, they're different species. But within that species, all the male fish eagles will play one role in the ritual and all the female fish, fish eagles will play a, a different role, but they'll all do the same ritual. All the males do the same and all the females will do the same ritual. Um, if we just quickly talk about courtship and reproductive strategies a little bit more, um, we'll go, we'll talk more about it a bit later, but um, I know that each school has to um, choose a specific uh, case study of some animals um, that they have to focus on and look at their reproductive strategies. I know at my school we spoke about uh, spiders and bush babies, so the IEB obviously in the end of the year won't ask you how do spiders reproduce? What is their courtship rituals? Because of course, every school has done a separate animal, but they could ask you a given example and then you can explain the species that you've learned. So I'm not gonna cover any in this video because every school does a different animal. And if your school hasn't done an animal, don't stress about it. It's not really that important. So fertilization is the meeting and fusion of two gametes, the male gamete and the female gamete to produce a new organism. 
Fertilization can be either internal or external. If it happens inside the body, it's internal. Outside the body, it's external. Um, for external fertilization, the male gamete, which is the sperm, and the female gamete, the egg, fuse outside the body of the two organisms. Both the male and the females must release their gametes into their surroundings. The sperm has to swim to the ova, so there needs to be um, water, and then external fertilization takes place. Um, so obviously, as I said, there needs to be water. It has to take place in an aquatic environment. The courtship rituals make sure that the male and the female sex cells are released near each other. Otherwise, fertilization would not occur at all. But with external fertilization, it's um, not very uh, successful. It's not always successful. Chances of fertilization are quite low, which means that the male and the female need to produce large numbers of eggs and sperm. So some of the disadvantages of external fertilization is firstly that animals have to be in an aquatic environment. Um, so their habitats are limited to areas that have water. It could be something like fish where they permanently live in water or like frogs where um, they have to spend at least some time by the water for fertilization to occur. Because they have to be in a watery environment, um, they are at the risk of the current being too strong, which carries the sperm away from the eggs, and many eggs are left unfertilized. Um, obviously, the females can't lay shelled eggs because the sperm wouldn't be able to get in. But because the eggs are unshelled, they're, they're quite vulnerable to predators and to the external environment, to like drying out, desiccation, and being eaten. Um, animals usually have to produce far more sperm and eggs to ensure that there's a higher chance high enough chance of the next generation being produced, which is quite a big waste of energy to produce so much sperm and eggs. Some animals with external fertilization, as I said, are frogs and fish, or well, amphibians and fish. For internal fertilization, the fusion of the gametes occurs inside the female's body, and the sperm has been transferred from the male body by an accessory sect organ or by other means into the female's body. Internal fertilization is the key to the colonization, colonization of terrestrial environments, so non-aquatic environments. Obviously, the chances of fertilization are much greater because sex cells are much closer together when they're released. Fewer sex cells need to be produced, which saves a lot of energy um, because the sperm is much more likely to reach the eggs. Animals that use internal fertilization specialize in the protection of the developing egg. Reptiles and birds produce eggs that are covered by a protective shell that is resistant to water loss and damage. Mammals, except for monotremes, which are um, something like uh, platypuses, their embryo develops inside the mother. Uh, platypuses, I think, also pangolins are an example of um, animals that lay eggs, but are mammals. But most mammals, the embryo develops inside the mother. Obviously, this is extra protection because the mother is protecting the um, developing young which increases the chance of survivals. The mother also supplies all the nutrients and gases and everything for the embryo. And most mammalian mothers have quite a high level of parental care. They continue to care for the young for several years after birth. So there's three types of um, ways that after um, fertilization that the eggs can uh, develop. Oviperi, ovoviviperi, and viviperi. So oviperi is when eggs are laid and embryos develop outside the mother's body. So hardly any development or no development at all occurs inside the mother's body. Most invertebrates and many vertebrates produce in this way. So a lot of like um, insects, etc., and some vertebrates, especially birds and some reptiles, such as we see here turtles or tortoises, uh, reproduce in this way. It's, um, an example can be a fish eagle. For um, oviparity, it can be external fertilization because the eggs develop outside the body. Um, but it can also be internal fertilization, for example, in the case of uh, birds um, or even the turtle, turtles, tortoises or turtles, um, where internal fertilization happens and then the mother or the female lays their eggs. Then we look at ovoviviparity, where the young develop from eggs retained within the mother's body but the egg is separated from the mother's body by egg membranes. So it's a soft shell. It's not a hard shell like an oviparity, but it's not completely um, 
transferred or the, the nutrients aren't given completely by the mother because it's separated by an egg membrane. So the uh, young gets its nutrients from yolk, which provides the development, um, the nourishment for the developing embryo, as opposed to getting the nutrients from the mother itself. These pictures are really gross. I'm sorry. Uh, for example, that's a gaboon viper. They often give birth to about 50 young at a time. So you can see that this is less than for what a fish or an insect may um, lay, showing that they do have increased uh, chances of survival, but it's still not like one or two like a human would have, or most mammals. Um, so survival rates are still slightly lower. The last one is viviparity, which is what mammals do, where the young are produced or released into the world at a stage of development in which they're already active. The embryo grows inside the mother's body and the mother is in charge of nourishing it by means of a placenta. So an impala produces, uh, reproduces in this way, as do humans and pretty much all mammals. If we look at the amniotic egg, the eggs um, have evolved to contain a water impermeable amniotic membrane. This means that water and amniotic fluid doesn't leave the egg, it's impermeable. And um, this membrane surrounds a fluid-filled amniotic cavity filled with amniotic fluid. This allows the embryo to develop on land without danger of desiccation, which is drying out. So this looks like some sort of fish or lizard or something like that. Um, and you can see here highlighted in green is the amniotic ca cavity filled with amniotic fluid surrounded by an amniotic membrane. It now, it here has a, a yolk sac that provides it with the nutrients and there's a hard shell egg around it. Uh, this is the development of a human. It's, um, there's the placenta and the chorionic villi, which we speak about quite a lot in the video on pregnancy. Um, there's a yolk sac where some nutrients are also provided, but a lot of nutrients are provided by the mother. And um, we can see here that this is the amniotic sac filled with amniotic fluid. The amniotic egg allowed reptiles to colonize dry land over 300 million years ago. Because they weren't entirely dependent on water to reproduce, they could explore habitats further away from land, I mean, further away from water, and they could reproduce on land itself. Fish and amphibians must lay their eggs in water, so they have to live in aquatic environments, but other animals can live further away. So reptiles, and then after which uh, mammals, birds, etc., can also lay their eggs on dry land. The amniotic egg of reptiles and birds is surrounded by a tough outer shell that protects the egg from predators, pathogens, damage, and drying out. So humans, of course, wouldn't have this tough outer shell as, um, or all mammals wouldn't have this tough outer shell because they are um, viviparous. So the egg develops inside of them. But reptiles and birds, which are oviparous, um, need this hard shell to protect the egg. Oxygen passes through tiny pores in the surface of the shell, so the shell is uh, permeable to, to gases, which stops the embryo from suffocating. Inside the shell, there are four membrane sacs that have functions like gases exchange, um, nutrient storage, and storage of nitrogenous waste, such as urea. So the yolk sac would be um, the example of the sac that um, provides nutrient storage. Together, the shell and the membrane create a safe, watery environment in which an embryo can develop from a few cells to an animal with eyes and ears, a brain, and a heart. Because reptiles, birds, and mammals all have amniotic eggs, we call them amniotes. So the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteater and the echidna, they both belong to the um, class monotreme, which is what I spoke about earlier. They are mammals, but they do lay eggs, so they're oviparous. Most mammals have evolved a type of amniotic eggs that develop inside the mother's uterus. In humans and other mammals, one membrane is sac, which is the chorion, fuses with the um, endometrium, which is the lining of the mother's uterus, and forms the placenta, which we speak about in a lot more detail in the pregnancy video. So if we look at parental care, this is any behavior pattern in which a parent invests time or energy in feeding and protecting its offspring. Not all species practice parental care. In a lot of cases, um, huge, huge numbers of offspring are produced. So like in fish eggs, 
which means that even though there's very low parental care, there's no parent to protect or feed the young, the chances of at least a few individuals are surviving, surviving are much higher because there are so many eggs um, laid and hatched. So if we look at, um, we compared a human and a, a fish, a fish would lay, for example, a thousand eggs, and the eggs have um, one in 1,000 chance of surviving to maturity, which means that of those 1,000 eggs, only one would actually survive to maturity. For a human, at one time, they'll, on average, have one child, but because of the high level of parental care given by um, humans, the chances of that child surviving to maturity are very high, which means that they'll also have one child surviving to maturity. So in the end, the different species, in this case, the fish and the humans, will actually end up with the same number of individuals surviving to maturity and reproducing. Um, like I said, such as birds, mammals, humans, the parents protect the unborn young while they're unborn and feed and protect them until they're capable of living on their own. In general, the fewer offspring a species has per mating, the longer the parental care period. That's the uh, general rule. Because this, because this is because it increases the survival chances of a species with a naturally low birth rate, such as mammals. And if we look at the giant water bug, they um, produce relatively few offspring compared with other um, insects, but they have higher parental care because of internal fertilization. So the chances of more eggs being fertilized Mm. And then the eggs are, once fertilized, are glued to the back of the male, which means that the male water bug actually carries them and fans water over them and protects them, um, which means the parental care is higher and these, some of these eggs are more likely to survive. Um, for frogs, are also an example of some that may show parental care. Um, for when there's unfavorable conditions, um, young frogs can hop onto their father's back and he can take them to a better, safer environment. The midwife toad also carries eggs wrapped around her back legs to protect them. So the number of eggs or offspring that any animal needs to produce for, se for successful reproduction depends on the chance of fertilization. So obviously internal fertilization means a higher chance of fertilization. So fewer eggs need to be produced. And the degree of parental care. Again, higher parental care means a higher chance of living to um, sexual maturity, so fewer eggs or offspring are needed to be produced. If there's a low chance of fertilization, there must be a large number of eggs or offspring. And the eggs young tend to be smaller because it's um, higher energy to produce so many of them. Chicks have a high parental care, so few offspring, whereas fish have a low parental care, so there are many more of them. If we quickly look, quickly look at survivorship curves, there's three types. First type is convex survivorship curve, where most um, offspring survive to adulthood, and mostly the old individuals die. As you can see here, humans are an example of type one um, survivorship curve. It's found in species that show a K strategy of natality. K strategy talks about high parental care, and um, this would be humans, birds, mammals, that in general, that sort of thing. Um, if we look at type three, this is a concave survivorship curve where very few offspring uh, reach adulthood, mostly the young individuals die. So as the um, individuals get older, there's a decrease in mortality. These species show an R strategy of natality with low parental care, such as fish and amphibians, and as we see here, trees. And the last type is type two, straight line survivorship curves. These are quite rare, um, but it does happen in some songbirds and in hydra. This is hydra. Um, and no matter the age of the individual, they're all equally as likely to die. So this is just a quick summary of basically the entire um, section. You can screenshot this, read through it. And there's a last little bit talking about amniotic eggs and then about parental care.